thank you to both of you and, and what an incredible conversation to have. Um, one of the obvious questions, um, Pippa, and if you don't mind, I'll just use your, use your first names. Um, Pippa, mm -hmm. is how does it work and how does it differ from what's currently on the market? Um, Iman, thank you. Um, it's great to be here. So the Depivirine vaginal ring um, is an HIV prevention um, modality that is what we call a long-acting prevention modality. So before I go into that, what we've got currently available in most of our clinics is a daily oral pill that people can take to prevent HIV. And it works absolutely brilliantly if you remember to take it. Um, and of course, particularly young people, remembering to take a pill once a day can be very challenging. So long acting HIV prevention agents are, are very, um, very attractive and very important. We are currently rolling out, um, I work for the Desmond Tutu Health Foundation out in Philippi. We have some mobile trucks that head out into the community every day and we offer the one monthly ring, which can be inserted into the vagina, left in situ for the entire month, taken out and then replaced with another ring. So that's a once monthly prevention local um, agent, the Depivirine ring. Um, and what is now going to become available is going to be a three monthly ring. So that could be inserted into the vagina, left there throughout the three months, providing protection against HIV, which means that somebody would only need four rings in an entire year to help prevent HIV, which is which is wonderful. I find that so many people don't even know that there are HIV prevention agents out there. And, and, and this so, is also um, a depivirine, is a, um, is, um, it's also a depivirine ring, the three month one? Also a depivirine ring. So it's got depivirine in that silicon ring, which basically goes into, spreads locally into the vaginal tissue and prevents HIV from entering the body. Before I bring, bring Bongi in, I just want to ask how safe it is. Um, we've seen interventions in, uh, you know, in reproductive health um, with um, uh, birth control and so on. You can get these two or three month injections. Uh, I might be a bit rusty on that. It's been a very long time since I've had to use that. But um, that it can have side effects uh, that are undesirable. Are there any with this? The Depivirine ring is incredibly safe. Um, it, it works really well um, and very safe. Sometimes causes a little bit of discharge, a little bit of irritation, um, but generally very, very safe, particularly if it's left and is not removed, for example, before sex or during periods. If it's left inside you, it's completely safe, very few side effects and helps prevent HIV. There was something important that you said, and Bongi, I want to bring it to you. It's really around our attitudes around preventative care and, and medicine. We're still in, an, in a context in South Africa where we have extraordinarily high new infections and new infections <coughs> amongst young people. So there's a lot of attitudinal and social shift that needs, mm. um, that needs to happen. Talk to us about your experiences around preventative uh, medicine. What people were saying is, you know, if people remember to take, and especially young people, this is why the three-month one makes a, a lot more sense from, from an argument standpoint, an efficacy uh, standpoint. Where are we in mm. terms of attitudes around <clears throat> preventative care? And could this be something that's more attractive to people who can't be bothered with the daily pill or remembering about a one-month ring? Mm. Yes. Okay. Well, firstly, thank you for having me. This I do agree that this is a very important conversation because um, we who work within the healthcare space really see this as a game changer purely because of, um, firstly, the medical intervention advancements that we spoke of and that Dr. Pepper just mentioned, but also the dignity that it provides the user and the privacy of accessing these medications without receiving the social stigma or even within the protections of the different types of relationships that we have with in the country. So part and parcel, if you see initially how uh, PrEP and PEP um, were rolled out within the vulnerable groups, there's still quite a lot of stigma that is attached to the medication, be it, uh, be it where people think we would say it's exactly the same as AR 
IVs or um, having to take a pill in front of family members and admitting that you are in need of such a drug or even having a partner where there might be violence in, in place and you need to do this secretively and it's not something that can happen. So what we're seeing is that with the deprivation ring, it, it provides the same protection but with a dignified privacy space where you are in charge of your sexual health. And I think with us, um, especially with us as digital marketers for healthcare programs such as the Desmond Tutu Foundation, ours is to amplify that work, work with the negative attitudes, because we know that there's always things like vaccine hesitancy, not trusting medication coming from the government. And so we dispel all those myths. We share all the safety factors, what young people might be afraid of. And then lastly, we refer them to programs such as the Desmond Health, um, Desmond Tutu Health Foundation, so that they can also access the services. So yeah, this is a big game changer. And I think our role as healthcare workers now is to say how do we position ourselves you know to market this new intervention and to get as many young women um in there because there's still quite a high infection and i think there's over 1,000 new infections that take place in south africa weekly that are all preventative and tools and medications such as these can really play a big big role in terms of reducing those numbers Bong, you follow up on that. Is it only high-risk populations that should be using this, or should it just become part of, um, you know, your your sexual behavioural plan, for example? That this is something you just lock and load so that you you don't have to worry mm. about it, and uh, you know, should you be using it in conjunction uh, conjunction with other prophylactics? Mm -hmm. So yes, um, we do definitely recommend it as part of a sexual health plan for any person who's sexually active. Um, we particularly target vulnerable groups like young women because they are most at risk for getting HIV. Um, they are most at risk for finding it hard to negotiate for condoms due to intergenerational relationships or even transactional relationships. So that's just our main focus, but definitely anyone and everyone. And I also would like to highlight married people because I think in the country as well, that is where we find that you're most vulnerable because you can't really demand for condoms and you, you know, you're not sure about the infidelity status. So if you feel that you are at risk, then this is something that you can definitely consider. And if you have things like medical aid, you can also see how you can access it there. But the biggest focus right now is the young woman aged 15 to 24 who hardly has access to private medical care um, that is most vulnerable for accessing HIV, even if we look at the high rape statistics in the country. So yes, I do agree. And yes, um, they still we still also need to focus at the same time at the vulnerable groups as well. Yeah. Pippa, you know, when I, when I hear Bongi say this, and, and this is something that's so pervasive in our society, is all these decades of living with high rates of, of HIV, all of the strides we've made in science, all of the education campaigns we've done, we're still seeing things like stigma, the issue of power in the way that women um, are able to negotiate sex and the terms under which they can have it, um, that how, how empowering this can potentially be. Bongi used the word um, a game changer. Um, again, fr from your perspective, you, would you like to see this just become normalized, you know, that when a, when a young woman is managing her, how she contracts sexually with whomever she might want to be with, that this is just part of her arsenal? Absolutely. Um, and I th we think that it should obviously be um, recommended for people who are at very high risk. However, anyone who wants to protect themselves and actually mm. asks for PrEP, we believe should be given PrEP. And, mm. um, and you know, giving PrEP is, um, it, it's much easier now and there are options and options are so important. So we focus a lot on what we call PrEP choice counseling. So we chat to the young woman or whoever comes to our clinics we discuss what the different options are between the oral tablet, the dipyrene vaginal ring, um, and you know possibly the injectable prevention if we have it. Um, but PrEP is also only one part of HIV prevention, which is something that we also talk about because PrEP should be part of a broader sexual and reproductive health focus. So we also encourage um, STI prevention, um, screening screening for pregnancy, preventing pregnancy, everything else that goes with preventing HIV, not just the PrEP. But it absolutely, I loved your word arsenal, it should be part of that. It should be available to anyone who wants it, who it's suitable for. So 
if you're pregnant, it's not suitable yet. We think that that'll probably change. At the moment, it hasn't been approved for pregnant um, people in this country, but we hope that it will be. But anyone who's over 18 and wants PrEP, absolutely, it should be available. So, so okay, so if, you, if you're pregnant, uh, not right now, um, I, I want to talk about from a health standpoint, what might exclude you from um, eligibility, Pippa? So it's simply just not approved. In fact, there are lots of studies now that are showing that it's very safe because the Dipurbine vaginal ring sits locally in the vagina at the top, wrapped neatly and snugly around that cervix. And it just works locally. So logically, we know that it's not really going to have any impact on the fetus, on the baby, but it's simply regulation. It's not approved. But there are more and more studies coming out that have shown that it is safe in pregnant and breastfeeding women, pregnant and breastfeeding people. So um, we think that that'll change very soon and that it will soon be available for all women, including pregnant and breastfeeding women. Availability is one thing, Bongi, but accessibility is another in terms of costs. I mean, what are, what, what are some of the issues uh, related to it uh, being rolled out um, more generally and being accessible to every woman who wants one? Mm. I think the first um, challenge that we are currently facing right now is just, as you said, um, societal pressure, attitudes towards accessing medication and also just the information that most young people need before even going and accessing those services. We find that there's quite a lot of misinformation that's out there. There's myths, there's stigmas attached to even PrEP and PEP as well. So we actually do quite a lot of work um, before we even refer them just to give them the facts um, and help them to make better health decisions. And then we normally find um, amazing community-based programs such as NACOSA, the Desmond Health Tutu, foundation um there's so many others that are currently having studies because remember right now um it's only currently available unfortunately at studies um and not so much in public facilities but we're hoping that with this big push um that it also will be and we also still advertise what is currently available in local healthcare facilities as your clinics because we did touch on prep um and pep still being available in a pill format and the importance of adherence but as i said um for us, we see these as um, a big game changer because <clears throat> purely because of the increased adherence rates um, versus them taking something daily and <clears throat> excuse me, having to take it every six months or every three months, it definitely will make a difference. Also considering young people's lifestyle as well, you know, having the opportunity to go once a month to a clinic and stop schooling, that is kind of disruptive. So this will provide, we believe, a dignified and more lifestyle suited um, form of prevent pre form of prevention for young people and most women who need it um, to protect them against new HIV infections. Thanks for that. And, and Pippa, sorry to use the word, but the installation. <laughs> or, um, you know, because I'm thinking you, you, you would have to go to the clinic then, right? Every, every three months. How invasive and uncomfortable might it be? And especially for those who didn't even know a ring existed at all, whether it's the one-month ring or now this uh, three-month ring. Talk to us about um, uh, how, how it's put in. Okay. So, um, so sometimes when, when people come for the first time, we absolutely, as clinicians, can explain to them how best to put in. We've got put the ring in, insert it in. There are beautiful little videos. In fact, the National Department of Health, um, who not only have got amazing guidelines for implementing this ring, they've also got lots of instruction videos that are available for everyone. So. We sit with a, we, we call our clients, participants um, in our implementation projects. We show them the videos. It can be done either lying down. Um, it can be done in a squat position. But in fact, most of the people who use it end up self-inserting it. So the first time we will show them and we usually like to feel just to make sure that it's perfectly in place. And it's almost like when a tampon is inserted, if you cannot feel that tampon anymore, you know it's in the right place. And it's the same mm. with the Dipavarine vaginal ring. Yeah. If it's well inserted, you don't feel it. Um, your partner also often doesn't feel it during sex. Um, and even if they do, it doesn't seem to be a problem. But to get back to your main question, it can be self-inserted. We can always help if people want 
want to be helped, but generally it can be done at home. Um, they can go home with their three month supply of the monthly ring. And we hope when there is the three monthly ring, they might even be able to go home with two rings, which means that they would have six months protection. Mm -hmm. They would take their first one out, self insert their second one, and then come back to the clinic to get their next two three monthly rings. So they would mm -hmm. literally have to visit the clinic you know, twice a year, um, they might come back off, you know, for other reasons like their family planning, but for, for HIV prevention, as Bongi said, it's such a game changer. This is gonna yeah. help so much. Um, uh, Bonky, I want to ask you, I mean, I, I know Pippa said, you know, some of the partners might feel it, but it doesn't seem to pose a problem. We know how men can really, really complain, especially when it comes to things uh, like this. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that question. But the, the, the serious part of my question really is around virginity. In South Africa and in a lot of traditional cultures, virginity is a very important thing. When Pippa was saying you can insert it like a tampon, that's been one of the questions. You know, does tampon <coughs> tamper, tampon, do tampons tamper with your virginity? So so just, um, you know, talk to us about that one concern that perhaps some communities and parents might have. Mm. Yeah, so um, I do understand that culturally um, virginity is a big deal that we're even in some provinces, just as the one that I come from, Kezer, and there's still even annual traditional dances that take place. Um, in terms of us as healthcare workers, um, our main focus has always been in terms of how do we protect young women. Um, and what we're finding where the issues with virginities come in is that the bigger risk is that they then are willing to have other types of sex, which are even more risky in order to preserve the virginity. So what we do is we deal with people individually, private in social media DMs and where we will make them understand the difference between having had sex and using a tampon, for example, and using the deprivation ring compared to having sex. And it being something that is still of virtue and purity because technically if you're worried, if you've ever had sex before, your answer is still no. But medically, if you are providing safety for yourself because as a young woman in this country, it's not safe or because you do require this because for whatever reason, then yeah. you can insert it and be clear of mind to say, I am still a pure person who has not had um, sexual activity. It's just that I have um, a medical, you know, um, that I'm currently using right now. So for us, it's always a matter of separating the two because it can get quite blurry, but ours is always just to empower young women to say, can you make the best decision for yourself? And you, if you're finding that right now, this is something that you need um, and sex is an issue, then this is the best advice for you. And yeah. then we always refer as well, yeah. Bongi Ndlovu, Dr. Pippa McDonald, thank you so, so much for this information. Um, really do appreciate the clarity with which you have communicated it. And I'm sure for those uh, you who wanted to know and who didn't know, uh, they've, they've certainly had, uh, you know, something to think about in our conversation today. So Dr. Philippa McDonald, one of the doctors at the Desmond Tutu Health Foundation working in HIV prevention research in Bongi Ndlovu, Southern Africa program, Manager for FAQ Health.